Welcome to the Grind It Podcast. You know, life can be such a grind at times, and so we're here sharing God's Word with you to encourage you to keep grinding and to not give up. It's time to grind. So here's the host of the Grind It Podcast, the old school skateboarder himself, Randall Tucker. Welcome back to the Grind It Podcast. Today we're going to continue Luke chapter 18. And we left off the last podcast talking about Jesus giving his disciples some instructions. He's continuing to do so as he's traveling to Jerusalem. And in Luke chapter 18, he starts off by telling them that they ought to pray. And not only should they pray, but they need to be persistent in their prayers. There's a great lesson that we can learn from what Jesus told his disciples because he gives them this story about a widow who was seeking justice on uh, her enemy and she was going before this judge who cared nothing about God and he didn't care anything about people and Jesus said this woman even even though the judge just kept ignoring her and denying her case she was persistent. She continued to, to come at the judge and, and tell the judge, I want justice. I, I, I want this situation to be taken care of with my enemy. And every time he rejected her, she would just come back and keep coming back until finally the judge literally said, this woman is getting on my nerves, so I'm going to take care of her situation. And, and, and Jesus says, how much more, if this, if this unjust judge can render justice like he did for this widow, then how much more would my father, uh, would God render justice for for you, and and how quickly he he would do it, and 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 so I talked about how you know when we're going through a, a life challenge, when when we're going through a storm and hard something hard has come into our lives, it it, it often just feels like. Uh, that that God is not with us, that He's not hearing our prayers. He's just far off in the distance somewhere, and He could care less about our situation. And 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 so I I, I gave a situation or an example from the Old Testament about the Hebrew people when they were in Egyptian bondage and how uh, they cried out to God on a daily basis and and how. God heard their cries and, and and he knew exactly what they were going through under the oppression of the Egyptian people and but their their cries were coming up before God and he finally uh, made a decision that it was time to act and that's when he uh, had been uh, I guess preparing Moses if you will uh, for this time of leadership because he would choose Moses to lead them out of of uh, the Egyptian bondage, and 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 they would start heading toward the land of promise that flow with milk and honey. But I I gave that example because it says two or three times that God saw what was happening to them, God heard their cries, their moanings, and their groanings. So God was not caught off guard, and 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 he finally at some point in time came through with his promises and 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 so the whole point of the last podcast and the whole point that Jesus is telling his disciples is to pray and to not give up to to not waver to not lose hope because we have hope just like the hebrew people when they were in egyptian bondage they they had the promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they, they, they would stand on those promises and, and therefore they would have hope even though they would get up day after day after day and continue to be slaves and continue to be beaten to the point that they probably wished that they were dead. Uh, but each day they would hold on to the promises of God that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and they would hold on to hope and they would just keep on keeping on until the point that the day came when Moses come to deliver the Hebrew people and he led them out and and uh, toward the promised land. And if they would have been faithful and trusted God and trusted Moses to take care of them, they would have went on into the promised land. But instead they didn't and they wandered around the wilderness for 40 years 
Moses would die up on the mountain and it would be Joshua that would lead them into the land of promise. But I use that example just to show that God knows what's going on in our lives. He is not caught off guard. He is not surprised. And, and, and not only does he know what's going on in our lives, but he, 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 he hears our cries. He hears our prayers. And he has promised us in his word that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So I, I just want you to understand if you're going through a difficult situation in your life right now and the storm is very dark in your life and you're full of, uh, of anxiety or you're discouraged or, or you're uh, worried about something, just know that God has not abandoned you. God is with you daily. He is walking with you every step of the way and he is there comforting you. He hears your cries. He knows your situation and he will come through. But the point of Jesus Telling that story to his disciples was to for us to be like the widow and to not give up. And and so I want to pick up uh, where I, I, I left off uh, with that story from the last podcast uh, because Jesus he he goes on to tell of of the widow's persistency and how her persistency paid off. He says, don't, so don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry to him day and night? Will he keep putting it off? The answer is no. Jesus says, I'll tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the son of man returns, how many will he find on the earth who has faith? And, and I want to start off with this in this podcast. I believe that, one of our biggest problems when we're faced with a life challenge and we're having to trust in God, even though we can't see God, you know, we, we trust in him through faith and, and, and we're holding on to the promises of God without wavering. Even though, even though our feelings are saying one thing, God's promises says another and we're holding on tightly as the uh, as we share from Hebrews 10 that, that the Hebrew author talks about and, and without wavering we're holding on to the promises of God but I, I think one of the biggest problems that we have is time because uh, Jesus said that 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 God he, he's going to uh, he, he's going to grant us justice quickly and in God's eyes and God's timing it is quick. Because God's not bound by time. We are bound by time. And, and, and when we're going through something difficult in our lives, we want to be delivered right then and there. We, we want God to hear our, our cries and our pleas and to deliver us or come through for us right now. We don't want to have to go through this difficult situation. We don't want to have to weather the storm. We want the storm to pass on through. And, 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 and so, because we are bound and, and uh, we're bound by time and, and we live in a society today uh, in our world today that you know uh, speaking of time that everything is literally at our fingertips I mean we have everything that we we could possibly need in an instant if you think about it, cell phones have just come out with 5g and and they're lightning fast and our internet at home it, it, it's blazing fast and and we have what we call fast food, and it, it, I can remember when they come out with microwaves, and they had the big turn knob. It was a big, huge box, and they had the big turn knob, and it would cook the food. And you know, now you can punch the time in, and 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 it cooks the food quickly. It takes a frozen meal that's already been prepared, and, and it heats it up with just in a matter of seconds or a matter of minutes, instead of having to wait for twenty to thirty minutes or two hours on to cook in in the oven. So we have fast food. We have all these blessings, but what what these um, this instantaneous culture what is it's have has developed? I'm afraid is impatient people because we're so used to having everything right now and in, in, in the blink of an eye, you know, we punch it in on the Google search bar and it, and, and it comes up immediately. We could click on this picture and it comes up immediately. We could kick, click on this website. It comes up immediately. Uh, you know, if we, we can find a car or, or a house or whatever we're searching for and it just comes up quickly and we can go through it and we can, you know, we can do this tour of this home or whatever. We can do it quickly. We don't even have to drive there. We're, we're, we are a, 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 a people of instant gratification, if you will. And we have become impatient. And, and when we become impatient, 
we, we start to treat God like our internet. You know, we upload a prayer and we expect to instantly download an answer from God and, and it doesn't work that way. You know, we may upload a prayer and we may pray about it for days and days and days, maybe even weeks, maybe even years before God comes through with the answer. The, 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 the example that I used in the last podcast with the Hebrew people, they were in Egyptian bondage for years and years and years. When I think Moses was like 40 years old before uh, God even come to him and said, hey, I'm choosing you to lead the Hebrew people out of Egyptian bondage. And they were already in bondage well before Moses uh, was chosen by God to lead them out of Egyptian bondage. So God is not on our timetable. God is not bound by time. God, a, 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 a day is like a thousand years, the Bible says, to God. And so just because we say a prayer and we're expecting God, and, and we should expect God to answer our prayers. That, that's where faith comes in. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so that's where faith comes. So we are expecting God to answer our prayers. And we would love for God to answer our prayers immediately. But it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes God makes us wait for the answer, just like he did with the Hebrew people in the example that I used. But eventually, God did come through, and he used Moses to lead them out of Egyptian bondage, and and they started heading toward the land of promise that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And eventually, Joshua would lead them into the land that is flowing with milk and honey. But we cannot treat God like our internet. We cannot upload a prayer to God and expect a downloaded answer it just immediately because it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes God, he makes us wait. And I, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know why he makes us wait. There, there's a tons of different reasons why God makes us wait. But there are great lessons that we can learn in the waiting if we would just not waver and hold on to God's promises and, and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us through the storm because he is there to help us to endure the storm. And, and at some point that storm will come to pass. It will go away and we'll be, um, we will have the answer or the, the that we've been looking for from God. And the sun will be shining and things will be calm for a little while. But unfortunately, more storms are going to come. That's just the way life is. And so God, sometimes he makes us wait. And there's great lessons to be learned in the waiting And God can use that time of the waiting to shape and to mold us into the person that he wants us to to be. But but what happens is we become impatient. And and quite honestly, many times we we just get downright angry with God because we don't think that he cares. And, and And if we're not careful, Satan will use that situation to discourage us. And, and, and if we waver and we don't hold on to the promises of God and, and, and instead we trust our feelings, then we can be in trouble. And, and what will happen is we, will, we, we can very easily walk away from God. And, and, and my question is, where, where are we going to turn to if we turn from God? If we don't stand on the promises that he has given us in his word and we give in to our feelings and we, we get mad at God and we turn away from God, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go go if we walk away from the one who spoke everything into existence and it was perfect? I mean, you think of uh, just the human body and and how awesome uh, our eyes are and our skin cells and all all these intricate parts of the human body. And you look, you go out in the in the uh, morning or the night sky and it's pitch black dark. I'm living out here in the country. And it's so dark and you can see the the stars. And if you live in the right place, you can see the Milky Way. And, and all these, you get a telescope and you can see all these other galaxies. You have to understand that there was a designer to all of this. And, and that designer is God. No matter how you want to argue it, no, no matter if you want to believe that or not, the designer is God. And he, design, he, he put all of this into existence. He made man from death dirt from mud if you will he packed it all in together made a body and then he breathed into the nostrils life and 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 just in uh, just a a breath of god we became a human being and 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 the way that we are designed is just mind-blowing 
And and so my question is, if we get mad at God and we walk away from God and we turn away from God and we say, I don't need you in my life if this is the way it's going to be because we're upset through a situation we're going through because we we don't think that God, because God d- loves us. You know, and we've heard all of our lives that God loves us. Well, people say, well, if he loves us, then why is he letting this happen to me? Why am I going through this situation? Well, th- there's many reasons why. It's because of our own choices that we made, and, we're, and there's consequences to those choices. There's, uh, you have the enemy, the devil, Satan, opposition, who's trying to discourage us and get us to, to leave God. Uh, God could be testing us, and 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 and, and so uh, uh, you know where are we at in our faith and our walk with Him. Do we really trust Him? There, there's and, and sometimes things just happen because things happen. There's sin in the world. There's evil in the world. It's been that way since the Garden of Eden when Eve took the bite of that fruit and passed it on to Adam. So there's all kinds of reasons why bad things happen. But the whole point is is that we don't give up. Like this widow, and she just continued to come to the judge and, and seek justice. And finally, the judge answered her her cry and says, I'm going to take care of this widow because she's getting on my nerves. And, and Jesus says, hey, look, God's going to take care of you. Just stay faithful. That's what he's telling his disciples. And if you think about it, what they're about to be facing in just a matter of weeks, Jesus is going to be gone and he's not going to be there to protect them anymore. And he, they're going to be on their own. And they're going to be leading the way uh, for the kingdom. They're, they're going to be out there telling people about Jesus. They're going to be out there putting their lives literally on the line. And many of them, they'll be killed eventually. Um, and, and, and so Jesus is preparing them. And he's saying, look, he's, he says, you got to be people of prayer. And you you cannot give up no matter no matter how hard it gets and, and that's the thing our, our situation it may seem real heavy to us but whatever we're going through it's nothing for god i mean the dude can speak one word and change our whole situation and jesus says in this story to his disciples he says if we keep on praying the answer will come he didn't say the answer may come he said the answer will come if we don't give up. So just like the the Hebrew people in Egypt, it, it took time for God to answer their cries. It, 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 he, he came through eventually, but not in an instant. It, it took years and years and years, even though they would wake up on a daily basis knowing that they're going to be beaten if they don't meet the quota. To, and they would be beaten so bad they would wish they could die, but the Egyptians wouldn't kill them because they needed their labor. And they would see their family suffering, and, and, and but they had the promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those promises would give them hope. And so they would get up on a daily basis because they had hope. And, 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 and eventually Moses was sent by God to rescue them out of Egypt. And, and so I just want you to understand that just because we you know we we live in this society this world that is that that is everything is given to us it's at our fingertips in an instant i mean you hit return on the computer or you hit search and it's automatically there in just a matter of a split second and god does not work like our internet does we wish that he would and sometimes he, he he does but a lot of the time he doesn't, and he doesn't keep the storms from coming. He allows the storms to come. I, I mentioned that in the last podcast. Just like he, he, uh, you know, if you go through the book of Acts and you see all these bad things that happened to uh, even the apostles, the the handpicked disciples that, that Jesus chose, you know, they're beheaded, they're persecuted, they're beaten, they're killed, uh, they're stoned. All these bad things happen to them. And, and and they were very faithful to God. So don't think that bad things are not going to happen just because you follow Jesus. And, and don't think when those bad things do come and we're faced with a life challenge, don't think just because we pray and pray persistently and consistently that God is just going to, uh, you know, in a blink of an eye, uh, pull us out of that situation or deliver us from that situation because there are lessons to be learned in the waiting 
Nobody likes going through hard times. Nobody likes learning lessons. But that's just the way it is. That's the way it works. But but what we have to focus on is not wavering. We have to focus not on our feelings, but on what God says in His Word. And in and, and this book, it, it covers anything that we could face in this life. And there's an answer for it if we would get into the Word and stand on the Word and study the Word. And the Holy Spirit will use the Word of God to help us and comfort us and strengthen us and give us the peace of God as we go through life's storms. And and, and so sometimes you know, uh, time is not on our side. It's like, what, is, what does Hootie say? Hootie, uh, Hootie and the Blowfish, who is now Darius Rucker, when he, he has a song, Time, Time, he says, Time, why do you punish me? And, and, and that's what we think, you know. We think we're being punished, but it, it's not that way. And we sometimes we feel like God doesn't care, but it's not that way. Sometimes we feel like God's not listening, but it's not that way. He cares. He knows what's going on in our, our lives. He knows He's not surprised by the situation that we're in. He's not caught off guard, and He He hears our cries. He sees every tear that falls from our eyes. And at some point, Jesus says, "If we don't give up, the answer will come." And the Father will come through. So don't waver and stand on the promises of God and not your feelings. It's very dangerous. And so Jesus tells this story of the widow and the unjust judge about prayer. And he's encouraging the disciples because he knows what they're about to be facing here in just a few weeks. Is He's going to die on the cross, be buried, and then ascend back to the Father in just a short time. And so he's going to, remember, he's trying to teach them because he knows that they're fixing to be taken over the kingdom. And so he's going to tell them another story about a tax collector and a Pharisee. And and if you remember, Jesus is sparring with the Pharisees all the time, especially in the, the book of Luke. And the Pharisees are those religious leaders who believe in their own righteousness. They're, they are self-righteous, if you will. They they believe that they are better than everybody else. They walk around with their, their noses in the air and they don't even they oppress the poor instead of helping the poor. They don't care about the common folks. They care about themselves and they care about their money. Uh, they care about their power. Um, like I said, they had nothing to do with common folk and they, they, they hated tax collectors, which is Jesus is using two opposite ends of the spectrum here. You got the Pharisee on this side of the spectrum, and then you got this tax collector. The Pharisees loved their money, they were very rich, they were very powerful, and they would hate the tax collector because the tax collector would be trying to tax them on their money and plus not only tax them with the government, but whatever the tax collector gets on top of what he owes the government. He got to keep that for himself. So the, the 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 Pharisees hated, and I mean literally hated the tax collectors, and they thought they they would call them notorious sinners. And so Jesus, he's going to use these two uh, these two people, the Pharisees and this tax collector, to teach the disciples a lesson about self righteousness. And in verses nine through fourteen, Luke writes this. He says Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. And two men went to the temple to pray. And one was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. Now let's do this Pharisee's prayer. He says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like the other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But, Jesus says, he flips the coin, he, he flips the camera angle, if you will, to the tax collector. And he says, the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted now now get that jesus says the pharisee he he returned home and he wasn't justified before god a pharisee who knows the word of god he knows the old testament like the back of his hand he knows the psalm he knows uh, the the prophecies he 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 knows the the pentateuch the first five books of the bible 
He could quote a lot of scriptures. He's got the big phylacteries on his forehead or, the, or on, his, on his wrist. And the bigger the phylacteries, the more Bible knowledge that he has. And so he, he would know the ways of God and the things of God, and he taught all of that. But Jesus said the Pharisee, he was full of himself. And he's bragging about how righteous he is and how he has done all of these great things that are according to the word of God. And Jesus says that guy went home and he was not justified before God. He said the one that was justified before God is the very one the Pharisee hates. The notorious sinner, the the tax collector. And, And what would make the tax collector go home justified before God and not this Pharisee who knows a lot of Bible and, and, and tries to live a lot of Bible, why would he go home not justified and the tax collector who probably doesn't know very much about the Word of God, about the prophecies, he surely wouldn't know as much because he doesn't study it as much as the Pharisees. Why would this tax collector go home justified in the eyes of God? And it, and it, and it all boils down to a heart problem, a heart issue. The Pharisee's heart was not in the right place. Jesus has told them this over and over and over again. And and they're standing in the temple. uh, They are there to worship God. And the Pharisee's pointing at this this tax collector and he's saying, I'm glad I'm not like this guy. And and you got the tax collector over there who, who wouldn't even lift his head up. He wouldn't even look up in prayer inside the temple to God. He just kept his head bowed, and, 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 he, and he asked God, he says, Be merciful to, to me because I recognize that I am a sinner. And that's the difference between this tax collector and this Pharisee. The, the Pharisees would never admit that they were in sin. They would never admit they were in bondage. They argue with Jesus. When Jesus says, you're in bondage, they said, we're Abraham's seed. We're not in bondage to anybody. Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, which we, we did in the last podcast, you see that the Hebrew people were in one time in bondage when uh, uh, they were in bondage to Egypt. Well, they were also in bondage to the Babylonians when Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed Jerusalem and, and, and destroyed the temple and basically wiped Jerusalem off the face of the map. And the people that he didn't kill, he took into uh, captivity and brought them back to Babylon with him. So they, they have been in bondage in the past. But the Pharisee just refused to acknowledge that he was in sin. And he thinks that he's above everybody else. And he's, and he's just naming off all this stuff that he has done for God. And, and he just looks down, as he always does on people. He looks down upon this tax collector. And yet this tax collector is stand, sitting there with his face to the ground. And he wouldn't even look up to God to pray. And he asked God, he says, Be merciful to me, for I know I am a sinner. And so the word that I want to talk about for the next few minutes is this, humility. Humility. And that's the difference between the Pharisee and this tax collector in this story that Jesus has just told to his disciples. And he's wanting his disciples to learn to 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 uh, be humble and not to depend on self-righteousness like the Pharisees did. Um Jesus taught a lot about humility, and he was definitely a great example of humility. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, Paul writes this. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. That's exactly what the, the Pharisee was trying to do. They were selfish, and they're trying to impress others. They love the praises of the people. And so Paul says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. That's totally opposite of what the Pharisees did. Don't look out for only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And he's going to give us the attitude that Jesus had. This is Paul said, this is how you need to be. This is how you need to live. He says, you live like Jesus. And here's, how, here's the attitude that Jesus had. He says, though he was God, in verse 6, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead... 
He gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. And, and, and if you remember in John 13, Jesus is washing the disciples' feet himself. He was going from person to person, even Judas, who would betray Jesus in, in, in just a short period of time here because he's on his way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of mankind. And, 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 and so uh, Paul says that Jesus humbled himself. He, he left his position of power and perfection in heaven, and he come down as a human being in, in a humble position of a slave. And that's what, when he was washing the disciples' feet, that was a slave's responsibility. But Jesus was doing it as an example uh, to his disciples. And he says, if you want to be first in the kingdom, then you've got to be last. You've got to be the least and, and, and Paul says he humbled himself in the position of a slave, and he was born as a human being. He, he, he goes on to say, when he appeared in human form, he humbled him. There's the words again. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And see, that, that's exactly what Jesus has told his disciples. He says, uh, I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And here's Paul saying this about Jesus. He humbled himself. And he's thinking of others as better uh, he says, uh, be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. And that's not what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees were totally opposite. And he says, don't look out for your own interest, but take interest in others too. Because you've got to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Even though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13, he says, Therefore, let one who thinks he stands watch out that he does not fall. No temptation is overcome, overtaking you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also so that, so that you will be able to endure it. And see, that's the whole problem with the, the Pharisees. They thought they were above temptation. They thought they, they, you know, they were not going to fall. But Jesus had told them over and over again, you are sinners. You are sinners. You need a Savior. And they, they just could not understand that concept, and they would reject Jesus. And then uh, uh, they're thinking, hey, this tax collector over here, I'm glad I'm not like this guy. He's, he, he's, he's the worst sinner of them all, and, and, and they pay no attention to the common folk, the people who are lower than they are. The Pharisee bragged to God about all the things that he has done to keep his commandments, thinking that he was earning his way to heaven but he couldn't realize the sinfulness that was in his own heart. And then we have the tax collector who he knew he was a sinner and he needed God's mercy. He stood at a distance, right? And he wouldn't even lift his head up before God as he prayed. Instead, Jesus said he beat his chest in sorrow saying, Oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. You know, I, I think about the, the, the two thieves on the cross. In Mark's account, it tells us that, that both of those criminals hurled insults at Jesus as they're hanging from the cross, and they know they're going to be dead in just a matter of hours. And, and at some point, at some point, one of those criminals realized that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, that He is their Savior. And at some point... He realizes it and he asks Jesus, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus tells him, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. That, that criminal, he humbled himself and, and put himself 
at the feet of Jesus, if you'll, if, if you'll let me say that, even though he's hanging on the cross, he humbled himself and said, I want to be in your kingdom. I've got to have you because I, I realize you are the Savior. You are the Messiah. You are dying to, to forgive my sins. And that other, uh, that other criminal just continued to hurl insults probably was mocking this other criminal now that he is saying, Lord, I have faith in you. I, I, I'm humbling myself and I and I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. So remember me when you come into your kingdom. And now that he has humbled himself, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. He is Now that he's humbled himself, God is going to exalt him and place him in heaven. So this idea of humility, it, it, it can be hard. It is hard for a, a lot of people. It may be hard for you because, um, you know, we, we really want people to think that, 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 that we're somebody. Uh, we want people uh, to think that we're something special. You know, look at all this stuff that I've done. Check out all these trophies that I have. I, I, I've got uh, one of my trophies from... Uh, March 11th, 1989. It's a, well, I won first place, and I had a four-foot trophy that, that went with it. I have no idea what happened to that, that four-foot trophy, but you you might can see it in the pictures here. I'm not sure if it's zoomed in enough, but I got pictures of the contest. You can see the trophy well, along with this board right here. Uh, um, I've won some contests skateboarding. I've won some crank it up contests with the stereo equipment. Uh, it, Going back to my childhood, I wanted people to think that I was somebody, and, and I wanted to be liked by everybody. I didn't want nobody to not like me, and so I did whatever it took to to make people happy and to satisfy people and for them to like me. And, 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 and as I got older in life, I realized God is the only one that I should be pleasing and, and, and because I know that I'm enough in Christ. Um, but... But we can, you know, if you think about, it, we we can, we we say, look at all this stuff that I have. Check out my trophies. Uh, people who hunt, you know, they they mount animals, and and I've I've got a deer, the very first deer that uh, I killed with a muzzleloader. I I've got it mounted, and it's, it's in my garage, you know. But we 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 have all these trophies, if you will, that 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 say, hey, look at what I have done. Look what I have conquered. And, and I want you to listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully here. You can spend your whole life trying to please people and get people to like you. But I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm here to tell you, and I've learned this over the, the 49 years of my life. First of all, people don't care. People don't care. You, you, they may act like they care, but they really don't care. The people who do care are your family. So you take care of your family. But you can spend your whole life trying in your job, in your workplace, whatever. But think about this. You can be replaced in a heartbeat. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished. Let's just use your job as an example. You could be... The, the greatest employee that company has ever known and you could make them all kinds of money and you can come up with all these goals and you can meet every one of those goals but you can be replaced and they may say they they like you they may say they love you they may even honor you and give you your own parking spot you know you've accomplished all these accolades and, and, and they, they give you a raise they give you bonuses they give you special privileges in the office, but let me tell you something. Mess up one time and see see what happens. You don't meet the goals that they set for you one time and see what happens. They, they, it, it, they, they, if something was to happen to you and you got disabled and you couldn't perform your job, you, you, they're going to let you go. They're going to fire you. I, I, I've seen it too many times. They, 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 they may care, but the only reason why they care is because you're making them money. And you're spending a lot of time at work. You're spending hours upon hours upon hours upon hours away from your family, away from your kids, because you're giving everything that you got into this job. And I'm telling you, they don't care. 
You're, you're sacrificing your time with God. You, you're, 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 you don't have time for church. You don't have time to meet with the brethren. You're so tired you don't even pray. You, you don't. Whenever you start to read your word, if you even start to read your word, you're falling asleep because you, you're not getting much sleep. And, and, and what's it? I mean, you're spending your wills to do what? I mean, what what are you going? It's what it's what Jesus says. You gain the whole world, but lose your soul. What is worth losing your soul? Absolutely nothing. What good does it do to conquer this and to conquer that? Because once you've conquered this one thing, you're already looking for something else to conquer. You can be replaced in a heartbeat you, with your job. I'm telling you. You can be replaced. Somebody they might not come in and do as good of a job as you you do or you did, but they'll come in and 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 they'll make the company money or whatever. Um, but you can be replaced in an instance in a heartbeat. And that company, you'll just become a distant memory. If you got a, a picture on the wall or a plaque on the wall, I like at one of one of my stores that I service. At the back door, as you're going out the back door, they got two uh, plaques, uh, a printed off certificate with with two guys' names that used to. They won some kind of award because of of, of how they check in the trucks and they they uh, keep up with inventory. For some reason, they they got this award. One of the guys, it don't even work there anymore. I never met him, never heard of him, and I've been at this job for over two two and a half years. And that guy's been long gone ever since. But his reward or his award is still sitting there hanging on the wall. But we don't even know. I don't know who he is. It, it, he may not even be alive for all I know. He, he's, he's forgotten about it. It's just a plaque on the wall. But, hey, the company cared at one point. But now that he is gone, somebody else has replaced him and is doing his job. And, and, and he's forgotten about. They don't care about that guy. They don't care what he's doing that company could care less about what he's doing in his life. But you know who does care? His family, his, his spouse, his children. They care. And, and, and so uh, I, I just I say all that to say don't spend so much time trying to conquer that you forget your family, that you forget God. And and you start trusting on yourself like the Pharisee uh, in Jesus' example. Look at what I've done. Look at all this stuff I have conquered. Look at all these trophies. Look at my the money that I have. Look at this house that I have. Look at all these cars that I have. Look at all this stuff that I've built up for myself. Again, Matthew 16, 26, Jesus says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? You see, pride says, I don't need anything. I, I've done all this myself. But humility says, I need God because without God, I'm nothing and I can't do anything. Pride says, I can do it on my own. And a lot of you have done it on your own. But humility says, I can't do anything without God. Pride says, I'll take care of it. But humility says, God, I can't do it. i, I got to have your help. I cannot do this on my own. I don't have the strength. I need your strength, God. I need you to walk with me. I need you, your wisdom to show me the direction to go through or to go into. Proverbs sixteen eighteen says, Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. And there are a ton of verses in the Bible about humility uh, in God's Word. But I, I just want to share about four of them. And before um, we end up this podcast today, one of the verses is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, where Paul writes, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be completely humble. In Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. So if we're full of pride, at some point, disgrace is coming. But, Proverbs 11.2 says, With humility comes wisdom. I don't know about you, but I would much rather have wisdom than be disgraced in front of my friends and family, my co-workers, my loved ones. Colossians 3.12, Paul says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, 
Clothe yourselves, just like you're putting on your clothes every morning. When you're putting on your clothes, think about this. Clothe yourselves with compassion. That's the way Jesus was. He was very compassionate. The Bible says over and over again that he was moved with compassion. Um, but clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothe yourselves with kindness. Boy, our world really needs some kindness today, doesn't it? Clothe yourselves, and here's our word, with humility, with gentleness and patience. So just like we put our clothes on each and every day, we need to clothe ourselves in humility. Uh, 1 Peter 5 verse 6 is another one. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. And there's that, that concept of time again. Not immediately, but if we humble ourselves and we hold on to the promises of God, and, and we keep following God, despite of how we feel, when we continue to follow God, God will lift us up in due time. And so Jesus is telling his disciples and us to be like that tax collector. You know, don't be sneaky like the tax collector, but he's saying, don't be like the Pharisee who trusted in his own self-righteousness. Be like the tax collector who would not even lift his head up. He would not look up into heaven to pray, but he kept his head bowed and he would beat on his chest. And he humbled himself and he said, God, be merciful to me for I know I am a sinner. And, and that's just the thing. We have so many people in this world who, like the Pharisees, they refuse to admit they're in sin. They refuse to admit they are in need of a Savior. And, and that, is, that is nothing but pride. And pride is keeping people from following Jesus and making Him their Lord and Savior. And so Jesus says be to His disciples and us, be like this tax collector, even though He's a notorious sinner, uh, in the eyes of the Pharisees, the, the, the tax collector went home justified before God because he humbled himself before God. He realized that he needed a Savior because he had sin in his life. What about you today, friend? The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care what you've accomplished in your life. I don't care how many trophies you have, how many mounted heads are in your room. I don't care how big your bank account is. God doesn't care either. God does not care about everything that you have accomplished. What he cares about is your heart and my heart. And is our heart relying on him? Or are we trusting in ourselves, in our riches, in, in, in our own hands? And what we can do with our hands? We are nothing without God. There's, it's, there is exactly one thing that we can never do. No matter how good we are with, with whatever, you fill in the blank. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot make it into heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but through me. So we, the only way we can go to heaven when we take our last breath on this earth is to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, to, to be baptized in the watery grave and come out of that water, a new creation in Christ, being filled with God's Holy Spirit, and God is living inside of us, and we are sealed until the day of redemption we have that seal that god has given us in the holy spirit if we continue to walk with him on a daily basis and put our trust in him who do you trust yourself or do you trust god and if we were to examine your life because god knows you're not fooling god i'm not fooling god he knows where our heart is but you can fool a lot of people but you can't fool god and so i'm just asking you who do you trust? And I hope today that you're putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If I can help you in any way, if I can pray for you in any way, please contact me at thegrinditpodcast at gmail.com and I will get back with you just as quickly as I can. God bless you. Thank you for listening. We'll pick up with Luke 18 and finish it off in the next podcast. Keep grinding. Thank you for listening to the Grinded Podcast today. May God bless you. If you have any comments or questions, you can email them to us at thegrinditpodcast at gmail.com. If you would like Randy to come and speak at your church or your next event, you can contact him through that same email address. 
Also, I would like to thank Jody Foster's Army, also known as JFA, for their song, Abba, as we use for our intro and our outro off their untitled 1984 album. May God bless you, and remember, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep grinding.